Okay, we can begin. Yes, ma'am. Um, we can. We are like we have few devotees still short. Okay, we're not going to wait for them. They have to come in time. Om Magyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksur Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Shrimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shanyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Vancha Kalpa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavanibhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasati Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So welcome to our ongoing Bhakti Shastri course. We're studying Chapter 13 of the Bhagavad Gita. Yesterday we spoke about, well we introduced Arjuna's questions. Remember six topics Arjuna asked about and Krishna was replying first of all to Shetra and Shetragna. Shetra being the field of activities and then Shetragna the knower of the field. So we heard there are two knowers of the field. We know about our own body but we don't know about others bodies. But the Supreme Lord, who is present as a super soul in the hearts of all living entities, knows about everyone. And Prabhupada gave the example about the king, how he has his kingdom. He knows about each and every part of his kingdom. But the citizens, they only know about their own land. And so then we went on, we spoke about the, the body and the elements in the body. Right? Remember? Yes. Yes. How, many, how many elements are there in the, in the field of activities? The f yeah, can you name them? Yeah, Nandalila? Can you name the 24 elements of the material body? I'll try. Uh, it's the five gross elements, the air, fire, uh, water, air, fire, ether, um, earth, and then the five uh, um, sense objects, um, touch, um, sound. Um, um, I, I just know the gist, actually, the five uh, sense objects, and then there are five working uh, senses and five... Uh, um, um, I think, um, not sure exactly, uh, I can name some of them. Uh, one is the unmanifested um, thing that is, which is called Pradhan, and intelligence, mind, uh, and false ego. Okay, you, you can revise it a little bit, you're yeah. a little bit off some things, but we, you, the five working senses, you know the five work, working senses are? Yes. Yes? The, the hands, the legs, and uh, the anus, the genital, the voice. Yes, very good. And five knowledge acquiring senses, Ananda Leela? Knowledge acquiring senses, the knowledge comes from? Can I say? Yes. Yes, okay. Eyes, skin, ear, nose, nostril. And the tongue. 
Okay. All right, 24 elements in the field of activities in the body. So we also heard Krishna present an argument about uh, the existence of the soul and the super soul. And he used the Brahma Sutras as well as the great sages. So Krishna was pointing out to us the importance of being able to quote Shastra and refer to Shastras and give the opinion of the great sages in presenting our different philosophical conclusions. All right, we're going to go on today, text 8 to 12, and we're going to hear about the 20 items of knowledge or the process of knowledge because Arjuna wanted to know what is knowledge? Jnana, knowledge. So, Krishna has given us a list. Lord Krishna has given us a list of 20 items, of the process of knowledge. So, we'll just quickly uh, go through these different items. We have to be a little conscious of the time because we do have a lot to go and uh, we, don't, we don't have unlimited time. So, first two items, very important in presenting arguments about the process of knowledge. Amanitvam, Adamvitvam, humility and pridelessness, very important in the process of knowledge. Right? You want to understand, you want to get spiritual education, it requires humility. We have to give up false pride. You go to the temple in the beginning, first time they may ask you, clean the floor, wash the pots. You have to be humble. You have to be willing. Janmashtami Prabhu, when you became a devotee, what did they give you to do first of all? Janmashtami Prabhu, can you hear me? Oh, he's not responding. Huh? Sorry? Jan was in a different class, Maharaj. Oh, he's in a different class, okay. <laughs> <laughs> of course, right. He's not in this class. He's in, the... he's, he's in your he's in your Bhakti Vibha group. <laughs> <laughs> Hare Krishna. Alright, who in have we got? Years. He was in my last year's Bhakti Shastra. <laughs> right, yeah. Okay, who can who can I ask? Who has been a devotee a lot? We'll ask Krishna Keshava, what did you do when you first come to the temple? <laughs> when I first came to the temple, what, the very first day I came to the temple? Yeah. So I, I, actually, I actually turned up early one morning in my jeans and t-shirt, um, not knowing really what to do. <laughs> and I stood at the back of the temple where the Matajis were until one Brahmachari looked at me and said, Brahma's this side. So I moved, thinking, okay, you must mean men this side. <laughs> um, but no, seriously, um, the first thing I did, actually, to be honest, was when, when the um, Guru Vashtokam started to be sung, um, I, I felt this, like, chill going, not chill, but, you know, like, my hair standing on end on my arms, and um, I wanted to cry because it felt so nice. No. <laughs> I was looking. I was looking at the deities. I was watching the, the devotees. You know, they were doing the, the two step, and I thought, this is amazing. You know, there's such a sense of togetherness here. Um, that's actually what happened when I first went to the temple. <laughs> no, okay. I know when I came to the temple, they told me they said we're cleaning the temple today, and they said you can help. And then he told me because I must have screwed my face up or something, you know. So then he said to me, he said, you know, cleaning the temple is like cleaning the heart. So I thought, well, that sounds good. I thought, I know my heart is really in a mess. I really need to do some cleaning here. <laughs> so it made me enthusiastic to take part in cleaning the temple. Yeah. Yeah, that feeling that I had made me feel enthusiastic about actually wanting to come back, you know, and find out more. Um, and I started going quite regularly after that first morning. 
I was still in my jeans and t-shirt for a few months, but <laughs> you know, it was a good feeling to be there before work every day. No, okay. You know, I was being part of something. Mm. Oh, and I did start serving prasadam after a few days. I did volunteer to kind of stand and you know serve the devotees prasadam for breakfast in the morning after the class, and that was quite nice as well. Okay, thank you. Well, the, the next quality Krishna brings up ahimsa, non-violence. And Prabhupada gives us a very Krishna conscious presentation of non-violence, right? Prabhupada explains non-violence, he said that if you look in the purport there, non-violence is generally taken to mean not killing or destroying the body. But actually non-violence means not to put others into distress. This is something which we're often pretty good at. We're pretty good at being nasty to people and saying things to them, unpleasant things, putting them in distress. So we have to try to cultivate this non-violence. And then tolerance, the next quality, tolerance. We have to toler we have to tolerate, we should tolerate. Somebody is nasty to us, they say nasty things to us, we should tolerate. In Christianity we learn about turning the other cheek. Right? Somebody hits you on one side of the face, you turn the face to the other side. Let them hit. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's tolerance. And Lord Chaitanya, of course, he says, be tolerant like a tree. And that's really a challenge <laughs> to be tolerant. But that's the standard, that's the real standard of devotion. Haridas Thakur tolerated, being beaten in the marketplaces. So tolerance. Very important quality. Simplicity. Simplicity, Prabhupada describes being, being straightforward, not being diplomatic or trying to cover things up, but being straightforward. Then approaching a bona fide spiritual master, Prabhupada said, this is essential. Everyone, you must have a spiritual master. You cannot expect to progress without the guidance, without having the shelter of a spiritual master. Cleanliness. Someone asked me just yesterday, I think, they asked me, is cleanliness important if I'm a devotee? Certainly. One who's a devotee, they will be very careful to keep everything neat and clean. When Prabhupada would come and visit the temple, he would be very observant to see how clean is everything. And if it's not clean, he would be very upset. He said, and Prabhupada, you know, he studied chemistry, so he gave a chemical equation. There's a chemical equation I'd learned at school, and Prabhupada quoted it. He said, base plus, base plus acid gives salt plus water. And then he applied it to the Brahmana. Whenever a Brahmana contacts a dirty place, there must be a reaction. He has to clean it. He cannot tolerate to see things dirty. So cleanliness is important. Steadiness. That's also an important quality as devotees. We want to be steady in our studying of scripture. Come every day for the class. Come in time. Chant our rounds. Do the round chanting. Go to RT, all these different, we should be steady. Self-control. We know about the importance of controlling the tongue. That's the most difficult thing to control. So we're practicing all of these things. These are all different items in the process of knowledge. Renunciation of the objects of sense gratification. That means we give up television. We give up cricket even. Oh, how could an Indian ever give up cricket? Is it possible? <laughs> yeah. Indian people very attached to cricket. In England, everyone's attached to football. They all have the football team. And you know, like this, we, so many objects of our sense gratification, television, gambling, playing cards, these different things, all waste of time. Then the absence of false ego, well that's, in some ways that's very close to humility. 
and the perception of the evil of birth, death, old age and disease. We should understand how much suffering is there in material life and we should be very determined to finish our material life and get out of this material world. Then detachment, detachment from everything which does not relate to Krishna consciousness, detachment from the material. Freedom from the entanglement with children, wife, home and the rest. When we have a family, we have to take care of them. We cannot be irresponsible, but at the same time, we shouldn't get totally entangled our whole life, taking care of children, and then the grandchildren come, and the grandchildren occupy our life all the time. We have to gradually get detached from these things. Then even-mindedness amid pleasant and unpleasant events, certainly we'll have these things, maybe more unpleasant events than pleasant. We have to learn to be even-minded in these situations, not to rejoice excessively and not to lament excessively. Aspiring to live in a solitary place, That, that could be a test of our Krishna consciousness. And Srila Prabhupada explains like that. He said, one can test oneself. You go and live in a solitary place and remain Krishna conscious. Don't get in Maya. Sometimes people go off on their own and they get in Maya. They just simply get lost. Detachment from the general mass of people. Don't get too much caught up with the, the public trying to be a little aloof from the ordinary materialistic non-devotees. We have to be careful. Accepting the importance of self-realization and philosophical search for the absolute truth. So these are the last two items in the process of knowledge. Twenty items are mentioned. Which one is the most important? Any hands? Who knows which one is the most important? First two, Prabhu. No. No. That's what I was going to reply. No. Is the first. Huh? Renunciation. No. Uh, renunciation. Uh, can I say, Maharaj, is it surrendering to a spiritual master? No. Tolerance? No. Actually, I didn't mention it when I went over the 20 items, but if you were reading, it's there. It's constant and unalloyed devotion to Krishna. Constant and unalloyed devotion to Krishna is the most important item. And Prabhupada explains in the purport, if you read the purport, Prabhupada explains, without having constant and unalloyed devotion to Krishna, all of these other items are useless. It's useless just simply to be humble, it's useless just to have a spiritual master. It's useless just to be detached unless you have unalloyed devotion, constant and unalloyed devotion to Krishna. All right. Now, some of these items may be abused or misused, used in an improper manner. Maybe you can think, I mean, one obvious example, which is mentioned here, is that uh, Prabhupada talks about freedom from entanglement with children, wife, uh, home, and the rest, right? So that's an obvious one. One could think, I'm really troubled, my wife, my children, I want to get away from them all, I'm going to become a, 
a devotee, I'm going to join Hare Krishna movement and get away from them, it's too much, right? We may think like that. One man came even in Hong Kong, there was one Indian man came to Hong Kong, he said, came to Prabhupada, Prabhupada was visiting, he said, Swamiji, I want to take sannyas. So Prabhupada looked at him, you know, sometimes Prabhupada would accept, like when Gorgovinda Maharaj came, Prabhupada understood he was a qualified person to take sannyas. However, this man came to Prabhupada, so Prabhupada said to him, why? The man said, my wife and four children are driving me crazy. So Prabhupada, of course, didn't give this man sannyas. That was not the qualification, right? So sometimes people may think that Krishna says, we shouldn't get entangled with the family, so I'll just give up my family. I'm going to leave my wife with the children, or the children, they're so young and they're, they drive me so mad. I'm just going to leave them. So that's not proper. And Prabhupada explains, if we read in the purport, if you find this section in the purport, he says, as for detachment from wife, children and home, it is not meant that one should have no feeling for these. They are natural objects of affection, but when they are not favorable to spiritual progress, then one should not be attached to them. The best progress for making the home pleasant is Krishna consciousness. And Prabhupada goes on and he explains how to make the home Krishna conscious, what you should do. But then at the end he said, but if it is not congenial for favor, if it's not favorable for spiritual advancement, then family life should be abandoned. So Prabhupada, of course, had difficulties with his own family. He tried. Generally his wife was not much interested. She was not no, she was not a demon, but she was just not, she was a woman, she just wanted her family and her home, and she was not so much interested in Krishna consciousness. So Prabhupada had different problems there, eventually, eventually he left, but he did not leave while the family were young. But once the family had grown up, then he understood it was time to go. Prabhupada was maybe... I think 60 years old when he left home. And so family were not young, the children had already grown up, a number of them had married. Some still had not married, but still Prabhupada understood it was time to go. And so he left home. But he only changed his ashram with the greatest reluctance. And that's the mood. It, one should be very reluctant to change the ashram. All right? So, some of these items could be abused like this. Maybe you can think of another item here which might be abused. Anybody? Sarna Shindu Pro. Maharaj, to stay in solitary place. Yes, right. Yes. Uh, how, how would it be abused? Advanced enough, we should always be in the association. Advanced people, you can only stay in solitary place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, aspiring to live in a solitary place. One, oh, I, I don't want people telling, giving me service all the time. I just want to be, sit down and read and chant. And you go and live in a solitary place and you sleep all day and you hardly read, you hardly chant. <laughs> you know, sometimes like that. Sometimes say, oh, I'm, I'm not getting a chance to do my sadhana here, I'm going to go on my own, live on my own. And you don't wake up early, yeah, and you don't do, your sadhana is worse. So these things happen. All right? Uh, we, uh, we have Hareshwari Madhavi Mahatma. Yes? Thank you, Krishna So even uh, the quality of tolerance also can be uh, like abused because uh, the, the people will say okay as a devotee you are supposed to be tolerant all the time so in that way they can uh, like abuse us okay and, like they can 
make us do whatever they want. All right, yes. The tolerance could also be abused. That we, instead of, you know, you may think, Oh, it's a big mess, everything's so dirty. And somebody said, just tolerate Prabhu, just tolerate. Or, or you could have the moon, I'm just, I'll just tolerate, I won't do anything. The place is filthy, I just tolerate. <laughs> no, you sh we should clean, because one of the items is cleanliness, right? Yes. Maharaj, I had a question. Can I ask or should I ask it later? Well, you can ask. I may answer. Let me see what the question is. Maharaj, you just said we should be reluctant to change the ashram. Yes. What is your reason? Huh? What is your reason for that? Why should we be reluctant to change the ashram? Well, the point is that you should be prepared for changing the ashram. You don't abruptly change the ashram. You have to prepare yourself for the next ashram. Just like, you know, you want to become a, a grihasta, the young brahmachari, a young woman, they want to get married and they want to become grihastas. They have to prepare themselves for that. There should be some preparation. Not that, okay, you go and tomorrow get married and then go and live together and you live together and then, you know, after then they start fighting and... No, they should spend some time preparing for householder life and they should associate with other householders and learn about householder life. There should be some kind of mentorship. In the West, they have uh, something called Grehasta Vision Team. GVT, Grihas Division Team, and they help to prepare young people to enter into householder life. Not that they're abruptly thrown into, or they abruptly fall into householder life, and then it ends up in divorce. But they're prepared for it, a lifetime, for a commitment to householder life. And similarly, somebody is want, wants to become a sannyasi, they prepare for it. There's a preparation for it, and they travel with another sannyasi, and the other sannyasi travels with, and can observe him, and guide him, and instruct him, and see how he's, what sadhana he does, and help him, and like that, to prepare himself for entering into the sannyas ashram. Not that you abruptly move into it. Yes, yes, Is, All right, thank you. Um, why, we have Krishna Keshava, maybe you want to say something? Yes, Krishna Keshava. Yeah, I did, thank you. Um, it, actually, it's not a question or anything to do with the class, really, but there's somebody in this classroom who's using a Zoom ID, Premanjana DD. Can you identify yourself, please? I've sent several messages. I, I need to know who it is in the class. Does anybody know who this is? Mataji, can you just identify yourself so I know who you are for the attendance? I'm sorry to interrupt, Maharaj. Yeah, okay. No, you have to do it. Yeah. Uh, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Uh, sorry, because this is my daughter before I used my uh, mobile. Sigarva does Oh, yes. so who is this? I, I, I will, I will change. Oh, no, 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 it's okay. I'll, I'll rename you. I'll rename you. No worries. I was just <laughs> yes. trying to figure out who it was. That's all. Thank yeah. you, Prabhu. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. All right. <laughs> Sorry, Maharaj. No, okay. All right. So, so everyone's, everyone's pretty cool. I wanted to say about the detachment from the general mass of people. Yes. Uh, usually, like, in the name of uh, doing sadhana, we tend to like not go outside and preach, and we use this abuse this thing like detachment. When you say we don't meet with outside people, like we do some in Radha Kunda, some Babaji's they want to stay away and do their try to artificially do you know bhajan and not like actually do preaching to others. Okay, yes, it's a good point. We have to be careful about detachment. Let's have a look and see what Prabhupada actually has to say about this in the purport. Uh, 
detachment from the general mass of people uh, Can, does anyone find it? Mm. Yes, Maharaj. It's, uh, it's on the page 653. Mm. Shall I read, Maharaj? Yeah, would you read, please? Yes, uh, naturally, when one is adapt adapted to spiritual way of life, he will not mix with materialistic man. That would go against his grain. One must taste himself by seeing how far he is inclined to live in in a solitary place without unwanted association. Naturally, a devotee has no time for unnecessary sporting or cinema going or enjoying some social function because he understand, he understand that these are simply a waste of time. Okay. Okay, so like that, Prabhupada's explaining something to us about this. Being careful of association So, the mass of people, ordinary mass of people, you know, sometimes we, people like to blend in. We don't like to be different from others sometimes. People say like that, I just want to be like everybody else, you know. I just want to be the same. Well, yeah, you just be like everybody else. Smoke cigarettes, and drink coffee and gamble and, and do all sinful activities. And go to hell like everybody else, you know. That's... You have to decide, who do you want to be like? You want to be like the devotees or you want to be like these ordinary people, the, the non-devotees? We have to choose who you want to be with. All right, any other questions on this? Otherwise, I think I'd like to move on to text number 13. We don't have any hands raised. For okay, so we've gone to text number 13. I'll just read the English. I shall now explain the noble. Knowing which, you will taste the eternal, Brahman, the spirit, beginningless and subordinate to me, lies beyond the cause and effect of this material world. So, we've heard the process of knowledge. The next section, text 13 to, up to 18, 19, they're going, going to describe to us about Gaya, the knowable, right? And what is the knowable? Gaya, who remembers? What is knowable? What is being referred to? <laughs> no, Manaji, please, come on. Yes, the soul. the soul, yes, and also the super soul, two nobles, right? The soul and the super soul, there are two nobles. We have to get used to this language here in the 13th chapter. The Kshetra is the field, and Kshetra is the north of the field, and the, there are, the, then we spoke about knowledge, Jnanam, and Gayam. The object of knowledge. So the object of knowledge, the gayam, the noble, the soul and the super soul. So what is being described here? Text number 13 is describing the soul. This text is describing, it's mentioned Brahman, the spirit, right? Remember yesterday we had five different descriptions of Brahman? Five different conceptions, do you remember? Who remembers the five names? Different conceptions. Huh? Yes, go ahead. Yes, right. Very good. So, this is describing about Vigyanamaya, the soul. Right? And it's described here, Brahman, the spirit, 
beginningless and subordinate to me. Subordinate to me. This indicates it's a soul, right? It's not the super soul. And lies beyond the cause and effect of this material world. Is everyone clear about this? Let's read the purport. The Lord has explained the field of activities and the nor of the field. Right? Where did he explain that? At the beginning of the chapter, right? The first few verses describing that. Then he has explained the process of knowledge. Where did he explain that? 8 to 12, right. And, and the, the knower of the field of activities. The process of, he has also explained the process of knowing the knower of the field of activities. All right. Now he begins to explain the knowable. First the soul and then the super soul. So this verse is about the soul. By knowledge of the knower, both the soul and the super soul, one can relish the nectar of life. Remember, what was knowledge? How did we define knowledge? Knowledge means to know. Anybody? Knowledge means to know. Yeah, the soul and the super soul and the field of activities, right? The field of activities. We should know these things. That's what knowledge means. So, we're learning about the knower. Knowledge of the knower. By knowledge of the knower, both the soul and the super soul, one can relish the nectar of life. All right. For, now for the soul, the jivatma. Jivatma has eternal. You're right. Okay. So. Prabhupada explains here at the end of the purport, Therefore, the description of Brahman mentioned in this verse is in relation to the individual soul. And when the word Brahman is applied to the living entity, it is to be understood that he is Vigyana Brahma, as opposed to Ananda Brahma. Ananda Brahma is the Supreme Brahman, Personality of Godhead. All right, we'll go ahead. Text 14. Everywhere are his hands and legs, his eyes, heads and faces, and he has ears everywhere. In this way, the super soul exists, pervading everything. So we can see something, it some, becomes a bit like the Upanishads, or it's like the universal form. That the Lord is everywhere, is ev everywhere his hands and legs. <laughs> so you can see it. he's a person. He has ears, he can hear. He has eyes, he can see. We cannot think he's just energy. You know, the impersonalists say, oh no, there's only the, the, the oneness, there's only this oneness, the all-pervading, the, 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 or the light. But here we see very personal descriptions. So the super soul is being described. The super soul is all pervading. Prabhupada explains the Supreme is different from the individual soul. The Supreme Lord can extend his hand without limit. The individual soul cannot. And then Prabhupada gives the example we offer things to Krishna. 
We offer fruit. What? How does he accept it? The Lord is far distance away. How can he accept things? That is the omnipotency of the Lord. Although in one abode, although in his own abode, he can extend, he can take everything, receive everything. So then, so the, the, the super soul is all pervading, the individual soul is not. The individual soul is localized. So at the end of the purport of text 14, this individual soul cannot claim that he is all pervading. Therefore, this verse describes the supreme soul, the personality of Godhead, not the individual soul. Text 15. Someone read. Yeah, I have a question. Or would, uh, you would like to take the question now, or? I, I think we can wait for a little while. Okay, you can read one Okay. The translation? Yes, 15. Yeah. yeah. The super soul is the original source of all senses, yet he is without senses. He is unattached, although he is a maintainer of all living beings. He transcends the modes of nature, and at the same time, he is a master of all the modes of material nature. So we can see some contradictions here. That the Lord is the source of all senses, but he's without senses. He's unattached, but he maintains all people, all living entities. These are contradictions. And these when they're contradictions, what's the purpose? Have you studied Ishopanishad yet? Not yet, much. Oh, you've not studied yet. Okay, anyway, in Ishopanishad you'll see similar uh, contradictions. The Lord walks, he does not walk, he's far away, but he's very near as well. And th these contradictions are there to establish the inconceivable potency of the Lord. When there are these kind of contradictions, it's simply to emphasize the fact that the Supreme Lord possesses inconceivable potencies. So, don't try and understand the inconceivable with our limited material senses. Uh, Some people think the Lord is nirakar, he, he has no form. Yeah, he has no material form. He has no material senses. But he has spiritual form, he has spiritual senses. In the purport, Prabhupada writes, uh, The Supreme Personality of Godhead has no hands, which are materially can't contaminated. But he has his hands, and accepts whatever sacrifice is offered to him. This is a, that is a distinction between the conditioned soul and the super soul. He has no material eyes, but he has eyes. Otherwise, how could he see? He sees everything, past, present and future. He lives within the heart of the living being and he knows what we have done in the past, what we are doing now, and what is awaiting in the future. Like that. So, this, it's an interesting section here in the 13th chapter, just describing something of the potency of the Lord. How is it described here? Now, uh, in, the, in the... Oh, it simply says, the object of knowledge, PM. Right? We're hearing about the object of knowledge. Remember the object of knowledge? The soul and the super soul. So text 13 was describing the soul. Now 14, 15 describing the super soul. Going on also. Describe more. Text 16. Someone read. Apurva Nila Chalishmari the Supreme Truth exists outside and inside of all living beings. The moving 
and non moving because he is subtle he is beyond the power of material senses to see or to know although far far away he is also near to <laughs> It's a very similar to what's in the Ishopanishad, the same kind of things, Vedic literature. So, the same message is there. The point is the Lord has these inconceivable potencies. We cannot see or understand with these material senses. Therefore, in the Vedic language, it is said that to understand Him, our material mind and senses cannot act. But one who has purified his mind and senses by practicing Krishna consciousness and devotional service can see him constantly. So this is, of course, the vision of a devotee, the pure devotee, they see Krishna everywhere. Love for Krishna, they see him without cessation. Prabhupada says in Brahma Samhita, Maybe Premanjana Charita Bhakti Vilo Chanena, maybe that verse. It was Krishna Shamsundar himself with inconceivable, innumerable attributes, whom the pure devotee sees within the heart of hearts, with the eye of devotion tinged with the salve of love. And then Prabhupada also refers to 11th chapter, the Vishwarup. Bhagavad Gita there it says Bhaktya Vyanyaya Shakya Aham Ivam Vidorjun. Right like that that verse about only by devotional service can I be understood, can I be seen be standing before you. Und only by undivided devotional service. Text seventeen. Please read. Although the super soul appears to be divided among all beings, he is never divided. He is situated as one, although he is the maintainer of every living entity. It is to be understood that he devours and develops all. Thank you. So, of course, the Lord is never divided. How many super souls do we have in your room? How many super souls are there in the room? You're all sitting in some room. How many super souls are there? Uncountable Maharaj. No. There's only one super soul. But that one super soul has expanded unlimitedly. But it's only one super soul. It's not that there are many super souls. There's only one super soul. But he's expanded himself. Just as Krishna can expand himself. They're all, it's all Krishna. They're all Krishna. They're not different Krishnas. It's only one Krishna. But he expands in the same way the super soul expands in every, situ in every heart. He's, he's never divided. He's one. The example is given of the sun. The sun at the meridian is situated in its place. But if one goes for 5,000 miles in all directions, where is the sun? Everyone will say, the sun is on the head. Mm. This example, in the Vedic literature, this example is given to show that although he is undivided, he is situated as if divided. All right. Uh, okay, we'll, keep, we'll take questions. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, my question is here when we are explaining like uh, the knowledge is about knowing about the soul and super soul. Um, under as discussed Vikyana Maya, but we also see that uh, Krishna did speak about the soul in the previous chapters, like second chapter, its qualities, like it's undivided and it isn't nobody can harm and like that. So, what was that, and then what is this which has been spoken 
so the soul's knowledge which was given in the previous chapters does it come under some other category and this is uh, i'm just trying to comprehend uh, what was given there and here is it all same or it's like a different level no well, since like arjuna had asked the question he wanted to know about what is knowledge and what is the object of knowledge so krishna has to explain to him what is what is what is what is knowledge and what is the object of knowledge krishna has to reply so he explains about this about the soul and the super soul yes yeah, certainly it's different it's a it's a continuation of what was presented in the second chapter in the second chapter we simply heard about the soul the spiritual nature we didn't hear about the relationship with the super soul super soul was never brought up in the second chapter he simply talked about the soul yes now we're hearing about the super soul as well and we're going to, we're going to look at the relationship between the two okay okay yes uh -huh. Thank you. okay we do have one more one more verse from this section on the object of knowledge let's read it text number 18 Someone please read. He is the source of light in all luminous objects. He is beyond the darkness of matter and is, and is unmanifested. He is knowledge. He is the object of knowledge and he is the goal of knowledge. He is situated in everyone's heart. All right. Thank you, Prabhu. So the super soul is the source of light in all luminous objects, like the sun, moon, and stars. In Vedic literature, we find the spiritual condition, the spiritual kingdom there is no need of sun or moon. In the material world, that Brahma Jyoti, the Lord's spiritual effulgence, is covered by the Mahatattva, the material elements. Therefore, in this material world, we require the assistance of sun, moon, electricity for light. But in the spiritual world, no need of such things. Wonderful. No electricity bills. Oh, everything is illuminated. In the lower planets, there's no sun or sunlight. They have to have the, the, the light in the lower planets. Uh, where the demons live in the lower planets, the subterranean heavenly planets, it's all dark, but the light from the jewels which the, the Nagas wear on their heads provide the illumination for the people living there. All right, so... Let's just see, just at the end of the purport, just to finish off here, We'll read the last paragraph. Someone please read that last paragraph of text, purport of text 18. He is situated in everyone heart as the supreme controller. The supreme has leg and hands distributed everywhere, and this cannot be said of the individual soul. Therefore, that there are two knowers of the field of activity the individual soul and super soul must be admitted one hand and legs are distributed locally but krishna hand and legs are distributed everywhere this is confirmed in the svetasvara upanishad 3.17 sarvasya prabhu ishanam sarvasya saranam brihat that supreme personality of godhead super soul is the Prabhu or master of all living entities. Therefore, he is the ultimate shelter of all living entities. So there is no denying the fact that the Supreme Super Soul and the individual soul are always different. Right. Thank you, Prabhu. So this is the, the feature here, understanding that there are two knowers of the field of activity and they're different the supreme 
superb soul and the individual soul, the Jivatma, the Paramatma. Right? We'll go on to the next section, beginning text 19. We're going to hear, a, well actually text 19 is also, it's a summary of what we've, what we've talked about. Right? We could read text 19 also. Someone read text 19. Translation? Yes. Thus, the field of activities, the body, knowledge, and the noble have been summarily described by me. Only my devotees can understand this thoroughly and thus attain to my nature. Thank you, Prabhu. Yes. Prabhupada explains three things. This, this section is described three things. Remember, that what is knowledge? Knowledge means to know the knower, the knowable, and the process of knowing. So these things have been described here. Combined, these are called vijnana or the science of knowledge. Vijnana, perfect knowledge can be understood by the unalloyed devotees of the Lord directly. Others are unable to understand. Hmm? So, then in the second paragraph, Prabhupada says, Now to summarize, one may understand that verses 6 and 7, beginning from Mahabhutani and continuing through Chaitanya Driti, analyze the material elements, meaning the field of activities, and certain manifestations of the symptoms of life. These combine to form the body or the field of activities. Right? So up to text 7, describing the field of activity. From then verses 8 through 12, Amanitvam through Tattva Gyanartha Darshanam, describe the process of knowledge, understanding both types of knower of the field of activities, namely the soul and the super soul. Then verses 13 through 18, be beginning from Anadi Matparam, and continuing through Riddhi Sarvashya Vasti, Vastitam, describe the soul and the Supreme Lord, or the Super Soul. These three items have been described, the field of activity, the body, the process of understanding, and both the soul and the Super Soul. It is especially described here that only the unalloyed devotees of the Lord can understand these three items clearly. So, for those devotees, Bhagavad Gita is fully useful. It is they who can attain the supreme goal, the nature of the Supreme Lord Krishna. In other words, only devotees and not others can understand Bhagavad Gita and derive the desired result. Alright? So we finished that section. We're going to go on to the next section, beginning text 20 up to 26, and we're going to hear about Arjuna's other question. Remember, he first of all asked about Prakriti and Purusha. So this section will describe to us about Prakriti and Purusha. Right? Remember we had some discussion about Prakriti? There are two kinds of Prakriti, right? There's the inferior Prakriti and the superior Prakriti. Living entities, we are also Prakriti. We are the superior Prakriti. Superior because we have consciousness. Dead matter, dull matter has no consciousness. So we are superior Prakriti. But we are also considered Purusha. We are also Purusha because we have that conception of being the enjoyer. And sometimes in this text also we will see that the living entity may also be referred to as the Purusha. But the actual Purusha is the Supreme Lord. Alright, so text 20. 
Please read. All right, so Krishna says both the Prakriti and the Purusha, the material nature and the living entities are beginningless. So, can you explain to me living, that the material matter, material nature is eternal Prabhu? Not eternal, but it's not eternal? Really? Krishna is wrong. Huh? You're saying Krishna made a mistake? I'm wrong, Maharaj. <laughs> yeah, I think you're wrong. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, material nature is described here beginningless, meaning it's eternal. Right. Can you explain to me how it's eternal? Anybody can explain to me how the material nature is eternal? Well, what happened? What happens to the material nature when there's annihilation? No, only for time being, it is. It won't be there, but again, it will be manifested. Right. Yes. Just Prabhupada gives an example. He said, just like clouds, sometimes a cloud will be in the sky, and then the cloud will not be in the, not be there. Sometimes it's there. Sometimes it's not there. So the material nature is like that. Sometimes it's manifest, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's manifest, and then sometimes it's not. So, it, but it's eternal. It's it just sometimes it's in a particular form, and sometimes it's it's visible, and sometimes it's not visible. Just like at the time of annihilation, what happens to all the living entities? What happens to all the universe? Where does it all go? When there's an annihilation, destruction, where does everyone go? Is it Mahavishnu? Ma yes, into the body of Mahavishnu. Everything enters into the body of Mahavishnu. He breathes out and then he breathes in. And go back in, right? And so the material nature like that is sometimes it's manifest, sometimes it's not. Is this clear, everyone? All right. We'll read a little bit. Prabhupada explains in the purport, just here at the end of the first paragraph of the purport of text number 20. Of course, it is to be understood that both the super soul and the individual entity are different manifestations of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The living entity is in the category of his energy. And the super soul is in the category of his personal expansion. You might like to note that, those of you who are making a serious study here, the, the difference here between the, the soul and the super soul, right? One is his energy, the living entity, and the super soul is his personal expansion. Then the second paragraph begins, both material nature and the living entity are eternal. That is to say that they existed before the creation. 
material manifestation is from the energy of the Lord, and so also are the living entities. But the living entities are superior energy. All right? So this is an important point to understand. We'll go ahead. Text number 21. Oh, well, let me see my notes. Uh, At the, at the end of that purport of text number 20, just in the last paragraph, halfway through there, Prabhupada makes a comment. He says, it really does not matter how these living entities or superior entities of the Lord have come in contact with material nature. The, the Supreme Personality of Godhead knows, however, how and why this actually took place. In the scriptures, the Lord says, those attracted by this material nature are undergoing a hard struggle for existence. But we should know with certainty from the description of these few verses that all transformation and influences of material nature by the three modes are also productions of material nature. All transformations and variety in respect to living entities are due to the body. As far as spirit is concerned, living entities are all the same. All right, we'll go ahead, text number 21. Someone read the text, translation. Text 21, nature is said to be the cause of all material causes and effects, whereas the living entity is the cause of the various suffering and enjoyments in this world. Thank you. So nature, prakriti, is the cause of all causes and effects. And the living entity, the purusha, is the cause of the sufferings and enjoyments of the world. So. We are responsible. Who is responsible for the suffering and enjoyment? We are responsible. We cannot blame others for what's going on in our life. It's all our responsibility. It's our doing. We are the, the doers. So everyone is suffering and enjoying in different degrees. This is the nature of material life. Prabhupada in the purport, he talks about how everyone has different kinds of residential quarters. You know, just like residential quarters, there's five-star hotels, and then there's three-star hotel, and then there's, you know, maybe, well, I don't know what's below that, maybe one star or something, you know, different levels. Somebody's living in the condominium, and somebody's living in the little uh, shack somewhere. And so we, everyone has different kinds of residential quarters. The snake finds a hole in the field and the, the mice, they're looking for a place to stay. And the insects, they're also coming. They've got, they're looking, the birds come and build their nests here and there. We're all making different residences for ourselves. And it, it's all going on according to our allotted karma, according to our past activities. When Kolaveka Sridhar came to Lord Chaitanya, Lord Chaitanya was offering him benedictions. Because Lord Chaitanya knew Kolaveka Sridhar was living in a hovel, a very broken down building, a little house, little cottage with holes in the roof. And Lord Chaitanya was offering him opulence and a nice home and uh, facilities. But Kolaveka Sridhar said, no, no, it's okay, I, I, I'm all right. 
He said, the, the bird is living in its nest in the tree, and I have my place. He said, everyone suffers, suffers and enjoys. The king has his palace. Everyone, they, we, we suffer. We suffer and enjoy according to our allotted, our allotted activities. As we say, the field of activities we spoke about yesterday, we've created that field of activities. The field, we've planted the seeds in different places. So in one place we've got, somebody's got a luxury body. Sometime one life you may, be, you may be in a very difficult condition. Next life you may be very opulent, very comfortable, very luxurious. Prabhupada explains, he gives an example very nicely. He said, in the purport here, text number 21, purport, at the end, half, just near to the end of the purport, is it, suppose a living entity is put into the body of a dog. As soon as he's put into the body of a dog, he must act like a dog. He cannot act otherwise. And if the living entity is put into the body of a hog, then he is forced to eat stool and act like a hog. But if the living entity is put into the body of a demigod, he must act according to his body. This is the law of nature. I remember this one man I was visiting, that somehow they'd taken a little dog, and, they, and he, he, he'd taken a little leash to put around the neck of the dog, and the dog didn't want the leash to go around his neck. This tiny little dog was really upset when he, the man would put this collar around the neck of the dog. But what could the dog do? He's in this dog body. He didn't like being chained. He didn't like having the rope around his neck. He couldn't avoid it. This is the situation. We're put into these bodies. We don't like it. And you, you see sometimes the dogs, how difficult it is for them. This is the reaction, so. So, this is the situation with the material world. We're given different residential quarters. We're responsible. Nobody else is responsible. It's all our own doing. But, Prabhupada explains, end of the purport, text 21, the Supreme Lord is so kind upon the living entity that he always accompanies the individual soul and in all circumstances is present as the super soul or paramatma. We'll go ahead, a very important text, text number 22. Please read. The living beauty in material nature thus follows the ways of life and join the three modes of nature. This is due to his association with that material nature. Thus, he, is, he meets with good and evil among various species. All right, so it's a, a very important verse. I think it's maybe one of your memorization verses, is it? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Yes, yes right. Mm. So? Due to association with the modes of nature, we meet with good and evil in different species. Because we are trying to enjoy the material nature, we're put into these different bodies, one after another. So this is our situation, very unfortunate, very regrettable, that we're here in this material world and we're in this situation under the control of the modes of nature and we have a tendency to enjoy particular modes. Some people are strongly attached to the mode of passion, some people strongly attached to the mode of ignorance and others strongly attached to the mode of goodness. Ultimately we want to transcend all of these things. We want to come to the spiritual platform. So, due to our association, Purusha Prakriti Stohi, Bhongte Prakriti Jangunan, right? The Purusha is there in contact with the material energy and we are 
some were enjoying, trying to enjoy, trying to find pleasure in every situation. We're looking for happiness, trying to enjoy. But different degrees of happiness according to how we associate with the material nature. For someone, their happiness is to eat stool. For someone else, their happiness is to work hard all day. And for someone else, their happiness is to write poetry and paint pictures like this. We'll go ahead, text number 23. Do you want to read or you have a question? I had a question, should I ask it now? Or no, you have to ask it later. Yes, ma'am. Okay, you can read. Yes, ma'am. Yes, At, in this body, there is another transcendental enjoyer, who is the Lord, the Supreme Proprietor, who exists as the overseer and permitter, and who is known as the super soul. Hmm. All right, so we're hearing about the, rel the relationship between the Purusha and the Prakriti. And we see that there's, a, there's somebody overseeing the living entity. All right? the, the, the Prakriti itself is not independent. Right? Prabhupada explains, he said, in, in everything, somebody's in charge, somebody's in control. Mm. We want, we want to do something, we have to take permission. Without permission, we cannot do anything. When we want to, when we want... Everything is based on our desires. What do we want? Where do we want to go? So, according to our qualification, right? The, the verse describes Upadrasta and Anumanta. Upadrasta, the overseer, and the Anumanta, the permitter. Wherever you go, they'll say, where are you going? Who told you to come here? What do you want? Why did you come here? Right? When you go on Sankirtan, if you go, like if you do book distribution, maybe you go around and you know, people will come, they'll ask you, why are you coming here? Who told you to come here? Everywhere, you know, there's the Upadrasta, the overseer, and the Anumanta, the permitter. And then Bharta, Bharta, the master, and Bhokta, supreme enjoyer. And who, who are these people? They're all the Maha Ishwara, the Supreme Lord. And who is that Supreme Lord? Paramatma, the Super Soul. So within this body, there's the, the Supreme Proprietor, Overseer, Permitter. We need to take their permission. So, we can ask you, you can just spend a few minutes here, we want to know what is the relationship between the Paramatma and the Jiva. Can you pick out some points here from the purport? Can you just uh, read through the purport here and come up with different references indi which indicate the relationship between the Paramatma and the living entity? We we'll ask all of you to do this. Read the purport of this text number uh, 20, 23, and you can go back to 22 also if you like, and come up with some references from Prabhupada's purport about the relationship between the super soul and the and the uh, living entity.
Do any of you have any references so far? What is the relationship between the super soul and the, and the soul? In the verse 23, it is written like how super soul and soul are like uh, fr uh, like uh, connected as a friend. But yes. The soul has uh, the option to reject this sanction. And super soul, he is not, uh, he works independently, not he un under control of anything. Okay, very good. Yes, friends. They're friends, right? Are you a friend also of your spiritual master? Yes? I will ask you a question, Mataji. Yes? No, no, you, the Lord is the overseer and we have to get sanction from him. So when we do evil, is it Krishna sanctions us to do evil things? He doesn't stop us from doing evil things? How does it work? Really? We have free will, we can do what we want. He doesn't stop it. You said, you just told me he was an overseer. He has to sanction. You're making a contradiction. Not very clear, not very... <laughs> you say we have, free, we, we have free will. Do we really have free will? How much free will do we have? What is, what is our free will? Uh, uh, like the, the field of the uh, meaning, uh, the field of activity. We can... our, our free will is either to surrender to Krishna or surrender to Maya. That is our free will. When we surrender to Krishna, then we're controlled by Krishna. And when we surrender to Maya, then we're controlled by Maya. We don't have free, we, we, we're not really free, we're under the control of Maya, both ways. We're not free, we're controlled, but we have that free will to choose, Krishna or Maya. Now Prabhupada explains, when we do, we want to do something wrong, we want to do some nonsense thing, so does Krishna not try to stop us? No, he does. He wants to stop us. But sometimes the living entity will insist that, no, I have to do it, I have to, I want to do it, I want to do it. Just like the man at home, the young man at home, he wants to smoke. The father says, no, no, don't smoke, it's not good, it's dirty, you'll waste your money, it's bad for your health, don't smoke. The boy says, no, I want, I want, I want. And the boy grows up. And then when the boy grows up, then he gets a job, he makes money, he goes out and he smokes. The father tried to stop him, but finally the boy was insistent. So Krishna tries to stop us. He discourages us from doing nonsense things. But some, we're so insistent, 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 then Krishna said, all right, go ahead, go and do it and just see what happens. So like that. It's not that Krishna wants, but it's Krishna is not able to discourage us from it because we're so foolish, we're so stubborn and so insistent. So he says, all right, then go ahead, 
and learn the hard way. That's what we call the school of hard knocks, learning something the hard way, <laughs> right? You, you get bumped, you get kicked, you get smacked, you get punished, then you learn not to do this again, right? Okay, thank you for contributing. Any other contributions about this relationship we heard? The super soul and the soul are friends. What else do you know about the soul and the super soul, their relationship? We have Hindu legacy Parmasati. Oh. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. It Had is the Bhukta and Bhokta. That is, individual soul is the sustain and the super soul is the maintainer. Can I hear, just hear that again? The individual soul is what? Bhukta, Bhukta or sustain. And super soul is the Bhokta or the maintainer. Super soul is the, the Bhokta, the, yes. the, the supreme enjoyer. No, sustain, sustain. Bhukta is sustain and the Lord is Bhokta or the maintainer. No, Lord is the maintainer and the individual. What last three lines it is given? Yeah, it is written in the first para last line. First paragraph? Last, last three. Last. The individual soul is Bukta or the sustainer yes, and the Lord is Bukta or the maintainer. Okay. Yeah. In, in the word for word meaning, Bukta is described as the supreme enjoyer. And bukta, the sustained bukta, okay. Bukta and bukta, okay. So one is the sustainer, one is the maintainer. Yes. Anything else? Um, we have Harishwari Madhuri Madhuri. Hare Krishna. So here it is uh, written, the Lord the who is always giving instruction from within and without. Yes. So uh, he acts like a, a, a spiritual master, Chaitya Guru. Yes, very good. That's right. From within, he's a Chaitya Guru. And from without, how do we get instruction? Uh, Bhagavad Gita, as stated in Bhagavad Gita. Okay, yeah. What about their relationship? We heard their friends. Are they always together? Yes, uh, the Lord is always with us in form as super soul. How, how long is he with us? When, like whenever we take a material body, the Lord is always present with us in that body. What about if we go back to Godhead? There he'll be personally present. Right, yes. Okay, so we see the, how the Lord is taking care, accompanying us, birth after birth in the material world. What's his purpose in being with us? To help us, to guide us, to take us back to our real home. All right? Uh, we have also Chidaranda Nimai Prabhu. Yes? Hare Krishna Maharaj. He's accepting my respect to this. Hare Krishna. Um, I just had a, uh, a point with, in, with respect to the relationship of the super soul and the soul. Um, I was just wondering, I, I just heard it on one connection that sometimes when the living entity really wants to enjoy something but he is not in a position to do so, the super soul provides the living entities with dreams. And, and, and then uh, and the, in these dreams, the living entity enjoys whatever he can't do in real life. And in that way, there is a nice, there is a compassionate relationship of the super soul towards the living entity. Uh, I don't know if that understanding. I, mean, I heard that during one class from one devotee. Um, so is is that applicable as in, in terms with respect to the relationship between the super soul and the living entity? Yes, I think it's nice. I've never heard this before, but it it if it it certainly sounds reasonable that the Lord arranges like that. That in your dream, fulfill your material desire. <laughs> yeah. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. 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 Hare Kr
Interesting. Thank you for sharing. Thank you, Maharaj. All right, so we've seen something of the relationship here between the soul and the super soul. Let's continue. Text number 24. Someone. Maharaj, I have a question. Oh, yes, question. All right. Let's... Maharaj, uh -huh. it is said that uh, he's, as he's overseer, right? Uh huh. It is said that there's an overseer. Then it is said that he gives instruction from within and without. How do we understand this? Well, that's the business. When... The overseer, he's going, to be, he's going to give instructions, isn't it? He's overseeing. He's, you know, he's like the, 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 the supervisor. So he's saying, do this, do that. He's telling us what to do. He's overseeing everything. And I think that's quite similar, that he's instructing us from within. From within he's telling us, do this, do that, go there, go and distribute books, print books, open a tempo, like this. Okay. Okay. From the heart, he inspires the devotee, one who is, has a pure heart, but then he will get the direct inspiration from Krishna, how to preach what to do, just like Prabhupada, he got the instruction. You know, previously his Guru Maharaj had sent people to England, but Prabhupada decided he would go to America. He didn't waste time in England, he went to America first. And then, once he got people in America, then he sent them to England. Right, how did he do that? That was the inspiration from the heart. Krishna says, to those who are devoted to me, constantly devoted to me, I give the understanding by which they can come to me. So Krishna from the heart, he inspires the pure devotees, what they need to do. Okay. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. <coughs> All right. Any other questions while we're at this point? Um, we have one. Yes. Hare Krishna, Mother. Like, really, I want to know. I have heard that there, is, there are two classes of people. One is Nitya Siddhya and Nitya Baddha, like who are always liberated and who are always bound. So, what about others, like uh, who are uh, doing devotional service, who are there in this material world, who are uh, doing devotional service? What is their position, Mother? Well, they're either Nitya Siddha or Nitya Baddha. Yes, that is what I have heard, Mother. Like, uh, there are Nitya Siddhas who are always liberated in uh, the spiritual planets. But Nitya can also come here. They can also come to this world. Okay. Sometimes Nitya Siddhas also come to preach. Okay. But they are, okay, they are like Prabhupada, who want to come and teach us or to give us this one. But what about us, like, who are there now in this material world? We're Nitya Badas. Yes. Yes, we're Nitya, Nitya Badas until we become Nitya Siddhas. Okay. So, we, the, means Nitya Badas have the chance to become the Nitya Siddhas. Nitya yes. Siddhas. Okay. Yes, the Nitya Siddhas, the Nitya Badas can become Nitya Siddhas. Okay. And there, you can become Nitya Siddha by Sadhana or by Kripa. Different ways in which you can become a Nitya Siddha. All right, but go ahead. Text number 24. Uh, one who understands this philosophy concerning material nature, the living entity, and the interaction of the modes of nature is sure to attain liberation. He will not take birth here again, regardless of his, his present position. All right, so that's a straightforward verse. The benefit of this knowledge 
We'll get free of birth and death. This is the result of the knowledge. So it's very valuable for all of us. Go ahead, text 25. Said the super soul within themselves through meditation, others through the cultivation of knowledge, and still others through walking without cultivated desire. Okay, so interesting verse. How different people may understand the super soul some by meditation, some by knowledge, and some by detached work, karma yoga. Right? So Prabhupada explains here in the purport, conditioned souls are in two classes. Those who are atheists, agnostics and skeptics, they're beyond, this. they have no spiritual understanding. But there are others who are faithful in their understanding of spiritual life and they are called he mentions introspective devotees, philosophers, and workers who have renounced fruit of results. Karma yogis, right? Those who always try to establish the doctrine of monism, meaning Mayavadi philosophy or Advaita philosophy, also are also counted among the atheists and agnostics. That includes also Buddhists. In other words, only the devotees of the Supreme Personality of Godhead are best situated in spiritual understanding because they understand that beyond this material nature is the spiritual world and the Personality of Godhead. Right? And then Prabhupada goes on to explain uh, those who try to understand the Supreme Absolute Truth by cultivation of knowledge, they can be counted in the class of the faithful. The Sankhya philosophers analyze the material world into 24 elements. They place the individual soul as the 25th. When they are able to understand the nature of the individual soul to be transcendental, to the material elements, then they are able to understand also that above the soul there is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He is the 26th element. Right? So, different philosophers, they have a chance to advance to devotional service. Prabhupada finishes the purport he says, uh, similarly, there are others who also try to understand the Supreme Soul by cultivation of knowledge, and there are others who cultivate the Hatha Yoga system and who try to satisfy the Supreme Personality of Godhead by childish activities. Childish activities. What's Prabhupada talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the Hatha Yoga, asanas, people do their physical exercises, bending and twisting the body. This is Prabhupada's childish activity. They're trying to understand God by childish activity. Will they understand God by asanas, by yoga postures? I don't think so. No. All right. So, in the 25, uh, Lord Krishna is giving different ways by which people understand the super soul. Some by meditation, like you do meditation, you do a, you do yoga, you may do uh, the astanga, you may do meditation on the super soul, the Lord in the heart, and some do it by cultivation of knowledge, by jnana, and others do it by working without fruit of desires. Karma Yoga, working in a detached manner, 
you're offering the results of the work. So these are different processes by which you can understand the super soul. But now going on to 26, Krishna gives another statement. Please read 26. Okay, maybe Radha Vindavan Chandra Prabhu, you can read. Yeah, Prabhuji. Again, there are those who, although not conversant in spiritual knowledge, begin to worship the Supreme Person upon hearing about Him from others. Because of their tendency to hear from authorities, they also transcend the path of birth and death. Okay, thank you. Let's look at the progression here. If you go back to 24, in verse 24, Krishna was saying, Lord Krishna was saying that you just understand the philosophy about this material nature, the living entity and the modes of nature, and you get liberation. You won't take birth again. And then 25, he gives a different process. He said, there's other people, they do different things. They do, some do meditation, some cultivate knowledge, and some do this karma yoga, right? Cultivating knowledge, that's the Sankhya philosophy. Meditation, that could be also, that's like, a, that could also be Sankhya. Sankhya philosophy, also a lot of meditation. And like, that they also trans, they understand the super soul. And here, 26, Lord Krishna says, because of their tendency to hear from authorities, they transcend the path of birth and death. So, please read the purport here to 26, and just look through the purport. Find something in relation to Prabhupada's mood and mission. Can you pick out some quotes which refer to Prabhupada's mood and mission there? Yes? Have we got some quotes? Uh, we have one from Murli Govinda Prabhu in the chat box. Um, that faithful hearing from an authorized, realized soul can transcend the material existence. Oh, very good. Yes. Faithful hearing from... Okay. Anindri Lamataji. Any others? Hare Krishna, this verse specifically speaks about those who are not well conversant in the scriptural knowledge, knowledge even those they can transcend, transcend the birth and death simply by hearing, where Prabhupada in the property is saying, although the common man is not often capable, but just faithful hearing from an authoritative person will help him transcend and go back to home, back to God. Okay. 
Thank you very much. Very nice. Very much in the pro. Uh, he hasn't mentioned that whatever position we are in, just we have to hear, hear from the authority. Yeah. Is there any ashram or varna? Okay. But here is, hearing is given for him. Shomya Mataji. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, in the purport, it is said, if one is fortunate enough to take shelter of a pure devotee, hear from him about self-realization and follow in his footsteps, one will gradually elevate it to the position of a pure devotee. Oh, very nice. Yes, thank you so much. So we can see many verses, many points here, very much in relation to Prabhupada's mood and mission. So very important verse for us. The importance of hearing from others, even though they don't have so much interest in philosophy and so on, but still if, somehow if they are attracted, just willing to hear. They don't, they don't have any spiritual knowledge, but they have a, they're willing to hear. That's the main thing. Just like when Prabhupada met his spiritual master, Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati said, Oh yes, I have noted him. He likes to hear. And that's a very important qualification. So hearing this tendency to hear from authorities, because of this, then they also transcend the path of birth and death. All right, so that you can see the connection here with the different verses from 24, 25, 26. Okay, text 27, we'll go ahead. O chief of the Bharatas, know that whatever you see in existence, both the moving and the non-moving, is only a combination of the field of activities and the knower of the field. Okay, so we're coming into the final section of this chapter. This is about the vision of what the vision of someone in knowledge, what they call jnana chaksus, the vision of one in knowledge. How, how will, what, what, how will one in knowledge actually see the world? So Lord Krishna describes, you will see both the moving and the non-moving. It's a combination of the field of activities, the body, and the knower of the field, the soul and super soul. That's everything, all living entities, both moving and non-moving. That's what just simply what they are. And the purport Prabhupada said, there are many manifestations like trees, mountains and hills which are not moving. And there are many existences which are moving and all of them are but combinations of material nature and the superior nature, the living entity. Without the touch of the superior nature, the living entity Nothing can grow. So the relationship between material nature and spiritual nature is eternally going on. And this combination is affected by the Supreme Lord. Therefore, He is the controller of both the superior and inferior natures. The material nature is created by Him and the superior nature is placed in this material nature, and thus all these activities and manifestations take place. Yes, go ahead. 28. One who sees the super soul accompanying the individual soul in all bodies and who understands that neither the soul nor the super soul within the destructible body is ever destroyed, actually sees. All right, so very clear, nothing difficult to understand there. The soul and the super soul are eternal, they're not destroyed. Go ahead, 29. <laughs> One 
one who sees the super soul equally present everywhere in every living being does not degrade himself by his mind. Thus, he approaches the transcendental destination. So, transcendental vision to see the super soul everywhere. We want to develop that kind of vision. In text 30, All right, interesting, that, the, that everything is done by the material nature, the self does nothing. But the self, it's, of course the self is actually, is doing something, is desiring. This body is made, Prabhupada explained, the body is made by material nature under the direction of the super soul. Whatever actions are going on in respect to one's body, are not his doing. Whatever one is supposed to do, either for happiness or distress, one is forced to do because of the bodily constitution. The self, however, is outside all these bodily activities. This body is given according to one's past desires. To fulfill desires, one is given the body with which he acts accordingly. Practically speaking, the body is a machine designed by the Lord to fulfill desires. And because of desires, we are put into difficult circumstances to suffer or to enjoy. This transcendental vision of the living entity, when developed, makes one separate from bodily activities. One who has such a, a vision is an actual seer. All right, we'll take questions. We'll, we won't finish the chapter today. Let's take some questions. Anybody? Yes. Uh, Maharaj, when I was just reading this, um, when you were reading the self, however, is outside all these bodily activities, and then um, uh, whatever is happening inside one's body is, um, uh, you know, is it, one minute, you know, where is that? Um, what? Yeah, whatever one is supposed to do, either for happiness or for distress, one is forced to do because of the bodily constitution, and whatever is happening in the body is because, not because of the self. Um, can you just elaborate on this? Um, um, I think I, I'm thinking like whatever happens inside the body, is it in, in terms of the physical nature or is it in terms of the spiritual nature? Um, what is exactly meant by these statements, Maharaj? Yes. Uh, one who can see that all activities performed by the body, which is created of material nature, and sees the self does nothing, actually sees. Right? So, Prabhupada is explaining the body is like the machine. The machine performs different functions, different activities. And you can look at the Sanskrit, prakriti kriyama, no, prakriti vacha karmani kriyamani sarvashaha, very similar. No? Uh, prakriti kriyamanani guna karmani sarvashaha. No. The bewildered spirit soul thinks himself to be the doer of activities which are actually carried out by material nature. So here also it said everything is performed by the body which is created of material nature. And the body is the machine. So the machine is doing everything, but the self is also, it doesn't do anything, but still he's there. There has to be the operator behind the machine. Right? With the machine, there has to be the operator 
and that op the Lord is there. And Prabhupada said, the machine is designed by the Lord to fulfill desires. Desires, the quality of our desires, that's the result of our body, which we've been, we've been given this body because of our desires. So when we say the self does nothing, the self is not actively doing it, but he's desiring. The self is desiring. The self does has to has desires, has, uh, which, which cause action, which cause the material nature to act. So it's not that the self is totally inactive, but he's not physically active. The self is... The self is basically the living entity, right? Yes, the self is the living entity, right. Prabhupada said, the self, however, is outside all these bodily activities. The bodily activities are certainly nothing to do with the self, but the, the, the desire is there within the, within the self. Yes. Uh, because in the second statement, you're saying that whatever activities are going on in respect to one's body are not his doing. So, because you are also saying that the, it's the machine and he's the operator. And again, there's a contradictory statement where he's saying that whatever the body does is not his doing. So that, that's, that's the reason I just thought of this confused. Oh, what, whatever activities are going on in respect of one's body are not his doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not in the sense that he's not physically doing them. The self is not physically performing the activities. But the self did desire. In the previous life, the result, the desire was there in the living entity and the result was he's been given this body and because of the body, the body is acting in a particular way. Prabhupada gave the example, the pig is eating stool, the dog is barking. Why is it they're put into that body, they can't do anything else because they have to respond according to the bodily nature. So. According to the activity and the desire of the living entity in the previous situation, they're put into the next body or the next situation, and the result is they act in a particular way. According to how they associate with the material nature, sometimes they're asso associating with the mode of passion, and so they're put into that passionate situation. They desire that mode of passion, and they're put into that passionate passionate environment, passionate atmosphere, and they react in a passionate way by, by the association from the past, from the desire which was there in the past. They're put into that situation. The body's a machine. It just, it just acts, just like the dog barks, the pig eats stool, like that. They, they act these particular ways according to the body they have. They have to act. They can't do anything else. The same way we have our human bodies. Our human bodies also are not perfect. You know, we may talk about the dogs and the pigs. I'm sure the demigods have a good laugh at us and talk about us, how we act. You know, we're, we have so many disgusting bad habits and faults. So it's because of the body. The body is the machine. The self is not doing it, the self, but the self desires, and that causes everything to take place. Is it all right? Yes, Maharaj, that makes perfect sense. Basically, because of the um, the body is in contact with the different modes of material nature, as a result, um, we we tend to do certain things on uh, which are not so desirable. And yeah. Right. Thank yes. you. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, we have Smithy Karuna Mataji. Yes, Maharaj. Maharaj, when it is said, when developed, uh, this transcendental vision of living energy, when developed, makes one separate from the bodily activities. Uh, does it specifically mean that now one is acting on the spiritual platform? He is above his normal, uh, when one works under the modes of nature, now he is above that, and now he is acting on a spiritual platform. Is it that, Maharaj? makes us separate from the bodily activities. Which verse are we on? Uh, Maharaj 30, verse 30, last line. 
This transcendental vision of living entity, when developed, makes one separate from the bodily activities. Oh. This transcendental vision, when developed, makes one separate from bodily activities. Oh. Because of desires, one is put into difficult circumstances. This well, Prabhupada's explaining the transcendental vision. It makes one separate from the bodily activity. Yeah. Yes, of course. This is the trans this is the transcendental platform. You have to come we have to come to that trans we have to develop that transcendental vision. And by developing this transcendental vision, then we become detached from the bodily activities. When we actually see this, uh, things in this way, when we see the living entity and how the living entity is within the body and the living entity is not doing anything but the body is actually the doer, the, the, it's the modes of nature which are acting, we see the results of the modes of nature, and th then we, th this way we become Diff we become detached from the bodily activities, the bodily activities, the material activities. So this is the, this is the transcendental vision. We want to develop that. I think they say, judge, judge the sin, not the sinner. Right? So this is, that's like transcendental vision. Judge the sin, not the sinner. So you want to see the transcendental vision, you want to see that there's a soul within the living entity, but that the body, due to the influence of the modes of nature, he's acting in these particular ways. We, have to under, we want to understand in that manner, transcendental, that is transcendental vision, to see how the modes of nature are acting, and the modes of nature are under the control of the Supreme Lord. The Supreme Lord is directing these living entities in these different ways. They're under the control of the, the Maya, and they're acting in these different ways. The conditioned souls performing their different activities for their bodily sense gratification. It is all due to the modes of nature, and the modes of nature are placing them in these different conditions according to their different desires. But they're all souls. So if we have that transcendental vision, then that, that is, that frees us, that separates us from the bodily activities. Yes, Maharaj. Makes one separate from bodily activities. Right? The, we, we don't just want to see the bodily activity. Oh, look what they're doing. We want to understand the philosophical concept behind the bodily activity. Right? Prabhupada yes. calls it transcendental vision. You don't just want to, oh, look at that, he's eating meat. Oh, look at that, he's drinking alcohol. You want to un we want to understand things in a more transcendental manner. What is happening? That this is the modes of nature, and these people are under the control of this material energy, and they're acting in these ways. Yes, Maharaj. Absolutely. Thank you, Maharaj. Any other questions? Um, we have one from Gadadar. immediately maybe we take for some time but after we are cultivating cultivating some knowledge then we know that that kind of desire our desire in the past is uh, not good for us then we would like to what say cancel our desire is it possible Maharaj? just like a case of Dua Maharaj before he desiring something after meeting with the Lord even he, he, he didn't want to, uh, his desire to be fulfilled, but still, Lord, give, give him. What, what about our case? If we want to, I mean, cancelling our desire. Mm, interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we have to be careful what we desire, because it certainly can implicate us into a, 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 a 
an undesirable situation. You give the example very nicely about Dhruva Maharaj, he didn't want a kingdom. After he saw the Lord, he decided he didn't want the kingdom. But the Lord said, oh no, you have to take it now. You have to go there in Dhruva Loka, he's up there in Dhruva Loka. <laughs> so can we change our desires? We can, we can change our desires. But it's not easy, we have to be careful that uh, sometimes the Lord wants us to change our desires and sometimes He's actually pleased when we give up our material desires. And so the Lord wanted Dhruva Maharaj to accept that position to govern Dhruva Loka. That, it was, that was service for Him. So for the service of the Lord, he had to go there. We don't know what Krishna wants. We should just want, to, we just want to surrender to Krishna. Krishna, whatever you want. If you want me to, to do it, if you want me to, to... But personally, I have no desire. I simply want to serve you. I want to serve, to surrender to you. Whatever you desire, Lord Krishna. So we should think like that. Right? Krishna may allow us to change our desire. He may say, no, no, it's actually good, it's good. You go ahead, you do this. So we surrender to Krishna. What is Krishna's desire? That is surrender, to have no desire other than Krishna's desire. Right? Okay, any other question? Okay, so we will stop here today. Thank you very much. We will continue tomorrow. We have to finish the chapter and we will go on to chapter 14. So please look over the, le the rest of this chapter and we will go into chapter 14 tomorrow. Thank you so much. Srila Prabhupada. Thank you. Prabhupada ki. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.